What's going on, Facebook and YouTube Live? Thanks for joining tonight on Another Line Live. After this short intro, we're going to get into tonight's topics. Let's get it. You gotta get your own way up in a cat and set the hook on a small mouth pass, and then you'll understand. You gotta get your hands on a Shimano reel. Energy lumens right up at you like what you feel. Step on the deck and give it a whirl. Hello and welcome to my world. What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining this episode of On Another Line Live. Thanks for joining. Uh oh, we got them Wayne boys in the house already. Somebody call the law. I think they're wanted in 14 different states. What's up, fellas? Uh, first and foremost, um, still rocking on YouTube, guys. I appreciate very, very much the uh, love and support I've got over the last month. Been crazy. Uh, thank you guys for that. I appreciate it way, way, way more than you know. Um, I sent out all the stuff that was that was given away on the last giveaway. So you guys should have gotten that, including Fred. Hopefully you got yours, sent yours out later, but you should have yours by now. I know uh, Randy sent, uh, sent me a message that he got his as well. Uh, a few other people. So that means that uh, I know Michael Dickerson got his as well because he posted on Instagram, tagged me in it. Um, so, you know, congratulations to you guys out there. I appreciate it. What's up, Mitch? How you doing, buddy? Dude, I, like, I'm digging the cowboy hat in your in your uh, profile picture there. I, I just wish I was, like, I don't know, man. I, I just I can't rock the cowboy hat. I wish I could. Uh, matter of fact, speaking of which, I was just listening to Cody Johnson there a minute ago, and one of my favorite songs that he ever did, does is called um, It's the Only Way I Know. It's like, I think it's called The Cowboy Song, The Only Way I Know. It's pretty awesome. But... Really cool. Thanks for joining, man. So again, guys, uh, if you guys have joined the YouTube channel lately, you will see that I am pouring my own soft plastics or injecting my own soft plastics with the do-it mold. Um, first batch is here. Turned out to be like... I don't know. You're not going to be able to see it, but it's like a dill pickle collar. I was, uh, if you guys watch the video, it's about 30 minutes long. I apologize because I hate putting out videos that are that long because I know uh, nobody's watching those things. But it seems like I, you know, it took me a while to get that thing done. But the last one I did last night, I didn't make a video on it. I just wanted to get in there and do it. The, these turned out way better. This is green pumpkin green. I really like these. These are like um, a lot more translucent. Uh, you can, you know, shine a light through them. You can see there. It's not in focus it's not going to be in focus but you can see that the light goes through these a lot better i like them a lot better but if you guys are interested in learning how to pour your own cinco's definitely go check out the video that i've just done um learning experience um but i do want you to understand that that video was from a perspective of somebody that i've ne i never have in my life ever injected or in attempted to inject baits and that was the very first time i did it on video so you guys saw the learning process. First off, I didn't get the baits hot enough. I didn't get the plastic saw hot enough. Um, I used way too much colorant. The X2 colorant from Do It Molds is very potent, guys. When I say very potent, I mean it is very, 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 very potent. Normally, you see these people online, and you're looking at forums and stuff, and people say a good place to start for a cup of plastic is 30 drops of colorant. So I was like, you know, we'll just start there and see what happens. So 30 drops of colorant that I see in forums and stuff gives you this nice translucent green. Um, you know, you can see through the bait still. I put 30 drops of the X2 colorant from Do It in there, and it turned out so opaque that you can't see through it. it it's a cool-looking collar. Very, very, very dark green. Um, so this time, instead of doing 30 drops, I was like, you know what? I'm going to put two drops in here, mix it up, and see what this looks like because I don't want to overdo it. I want to make it right. So I, I, two drops is about perfect. I think I can get away with one if I wanted to. One drop of the colorant for a cup of plastic. So that's crazy. No, Dennis, I don't, man. I've still been, I'm, I'm working. Guys, creating hats seems to be like pulling teeth. I got like, I, mess, I made a post on Facebook there a few weeks, a few months ago, real now, 
And I had about 30 companies. Hey, we're interested. We're interested. Hey, we'll do it. We're in Ironton. We're in Asheville. We're in Huntington. We're in Barbersville. We do this. We do that. And I send like all these people what I want. And not one person got back to me. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm asking too much. Maybe they can't get the hats in stock. I'm wanting a Richardson 112 hat, which is one of the biggest you know hats that are out there that people enjoy wearing. I'm still working on it, brother. Trust me, I'd love to have hats before the Classic, which is this weekend, but that's not going to happen, no doubt. But I can promise you, I'm working on them. Um, you know, I know you guys are thinking I'm a broke record and haven't done anything, but I do have hats coming. Um, I do. I don't know if you guys saw this or not. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Trying to find it. Eventually, maybe I can't. Maybe that's why nobody's buying it because they can't find it. It's buried deep in Amazon I'm trying to find it. But I do have a, a new Keeping It Real shirt that's on um, Amazon. I'm looking for it right now, guys, to show you. But apparently, again, like I said, it must be buried so deep that you can't. Let's. I'm going to. I'm going to find it. I'm finding it. Just just so you know. So give me just a second here. The re So Amazon merch, the way it works out is I post the stuff on there. I put what college and stuff I wanted to be available in. And then they give me the opportunity to um, basically sell the shirts. I never touch it. And they send them to you guys via Prime, which is pretty cool. But I am logging into my merch account here just so I can show you guys this this shirt. Maybe. Maybe. There it is. There it is. There it is. <laughs> I'm going to drop in the comments here. I don't know if you guys are seeing that, but here is the shirt. I'm going to share my screen, show you guys what's up. I did post the link down there in case anybody's interested. I'm not pushing my brand on you by any means, but here is the shirt. Uh, let's see here. Here it is. Um, so you can see it here. The cool thing about it is it's in both men and women fit, which is really pretty cool because I'd have to keep these things in uh, uber amounts of collars. You can see that it's available in five different colors, asphalt, white, White is one of my favorites. You have a uh, silver. We have a heather, dark heather, and a heather gray. But on the back side of this thing, got a pretty cool little uh, 1.5 there with the keeping it real underneath there. Again, on another line logo on the front. Get it in pretty much any size you want. And um, 25 bucks. That'll be shipped to your house. Free shipping if you have Prime, which is pretty cool. Anyway, back to the thing. Um, so let's see. What's up, Adam? Let's see. I know there's all kind of different materials, but do the ones you make have like a Yamamoto composition or like a dinger? If you, uh, dingers are more rubbery, and the Yamamoto is like a granular, more fragile. It seems to be bite for or get more bites for whatever reason. All right, so hold on one second. Well, nope. Sorry, I was going to show you a dinger next to. Uh, this one, um, but I will tell you that it's more like a yum dinger. However, the the fragile the fragiliness, if you will, must be French. the The fragileness of a Yamamoto comes for the salt that's added. Salt in the bait makes the bait sink quicker, but it also makes it more fragile. When you set the hook and they break in two, a lot of times that's because it has a high salt content. Um, Excuse me, a lot of people think that that makes fish hold on long, longer and it could, potentially. I'm not saying that it doesn't. Uh, I use fish salt, so I think that helps a lot. But the reason that, again, Yamamoto get, has that fragileness to them is because of the salt. I'm going to get into adding salt. However, the reason that I chose to just kind of go with the rubbery feel here is because 
99% of the time, you can see the action there. That you know, that 99% of the time, I'm wacky rigging this four inch Cinco with um, probably either now that I have a do it mold to pour myself with lead, I'll probably use those. But right now, I'm using the Jackal, uh, I think it's 3 16 ounce, fairly heavy for a wacky rig. I like it to fall a lot quicker than most. But normally, you know, I'm, I'm fishing with a weight, so I really don't care how fast they fall. Um, the the texture of them, I was really impressed with. I thought it was going to be like something that uh, would be really tough, too soft. Um, just to give you guys an, uh, an what I did buy, I bought a, or I got a kit from Do It that has the soft plastisol in it, um, and it comes with softener. So, you know. I'm going to potentially try to use the softener in my next batch to see what the difference of it is. Um, I'm also in the process of buying some worm oil from JB's Fish Sauce with my signature blend of a uh, pinch of garlic on there. So my baits, I got this really cool idea and I don't know that I'll be able to produce enough of them to make it happen, but maybe throughout the, the summer here when I create some baits, I want to create this idea. Well, you know, we're all a fishing community here on, on another line me and you guys out there watching and people that watch my videos and all that stuff. But I want to create this idea of the selfie stick. And I don't want to call it the selfie stick, which is kind of, kind of, you know, lame, but I want to drop a couple packs of these things. Not this many, obviously don't be like 30 in a bag, maybe five, six, eight in a bag, like at the tackle box or borders or places like that. And these baits are 100% free. You guys, you know, first come, first serve, one bag a piece. You walk into the tackle shop, find the on another line selfie stick, and you pick up a bag of those. And the only stipulation is that you take a photo of you with the baits at the bait store, and you post pictures of fish that you catch on the baits. I think that's a solid idea, um, especially since I'm partnering with Do It. I think this is a really cool idea. I can't do it for the life of this stuff, obviously, because it's going to cost me a fortune. But I think it'd be cool to do for a year. But as far as that goes, they're more dinger, less Yamamoto, but they're going to be Yamamoto and dinger. Depends on what I'm looking at for. Um, the salt content seems to be kind of up in the air. A lot of people use a ton. If you use way too much, it's going to uh, compromise the, um, the chemical composition of your plastic it's going to make it really fragile. Uh, and the type of salt I've learned is a huge deal too. A lot of people use popcorn salt. Really fine stuff. It does add, add weight, but it doesn't have a bunch of granulated sugar, or I'm sorry, salt, that's going to cause, you know, basically voids of air within your bait. So stay tuned with that. These are dinger-like. Yeah, Corey, like I said, I'll uh, holler at you tomorrow. I'll send you a PayPal link or whatever. I'll PayPal you or whatever I need to do. Pretty excited about that. Um, Bassmaster Classic coming up this weekend. If you guys are going to be down there, let me know. I'd love to be able to hang out with you guys. Um, it's going to be a good time. Again, I'm pulling for my boy Matt Robertson out there. I'm hoping that he can actually pull it off. Um, you know, Matt Robertson is a great guy all around, and he, he's like he's a jokester and stuff. But like, I think they, sh they, f they like, if you take a picture of Matt Robertson, it's like the, the hammer section at Lowe's. The dude can catch fish. I won't, man. Not too many people like, uh, pink Cinco's, but I got you, bro. <laughs> Between you and, uh, Mark Hickey, pink Cinco's are all around. But anyway, like I said, Bassmaster Classic coming up. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I did, again, I'm going to be doing some videos here soon um, about the Yolotech stuff that I got in for the um, thing that I won that you guys helped me out on. Appreciate that. That's good. we got some videos coming up soon. Um, I have one more video coming out of uh, basically doing advanced editing techniques when you're actually editing your GoPro videos. A lot of people wanted to see how I did it. I have two videos right now on my channel. Uh, one of them is basically getting the uh, files from your SD card, your micro SD card from your, um, you know, your, uh, action camera onto your computer. That's video. Number one, video number two is using a free program to edit your first video. 
Again, there are better programs out there. My favorite, what I use is Premier Pro, but it does cost you like 15 to 18 bucks a month. So uh, you don't ever own it. Well, I hate that model. I hate that mentality, but they're getting money out of me every month. Um, but I like it. I use it. And again, I teach it. So it's, it's just kind of one and the same for me. Helps me get better to help to teach my students as well. But I have one more coming out with, with advanced editing techniques, like adding titles and uh, doing different kind of like jump cuts and things. It's not going to be near as long as the other two, but it's going to be something if you guys are interested in, you know, looking at that. Uh, and the very end of it is I'm going to show you guys how to upload the video to YouTube. Uh, you guys will actually see me uploading the video that I will be working on, which is weird. Um, but I'm going to upload it to video, upload it to uh, YouTube. And I'm going to talk about the different types of things that you can do on YouTube, like schedule it, uh, set it as premiere. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that you probably will want to know before you get started on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is a really cool way to to archive your footage, guys. Again, one of the very first videos out on my channel is when me and Kyle put down 22 pounds of bass at, at Grayson Lake. Uh, still the most unbelievable day I've ever had at Grayson in my life. Uh, I would rather fish Grayson than the Aceville three times over it right now for some reason. I don't know. I just like the lake a lot better. It's just funner to fish for me. But that one day, you know, I can go back and relive that from here on until eternity, until I die, because YouTube's not going anywhere. Um, and it also gives you a way to have something where you can share it with your buddies or whatever. But I will tell you that having a YouTube channel um, used to be you would get paid for every view. Now you have to have a thousand subscribers and so many hours of watch time. The hours of watch time, guys, if you have a thousand subscribers, you're definitely going to blow that hours of watch time out of the water. Um, but that's something to uh, take into consideration. Uh, and also one thing that I want you to understand is that starting a YouTube channel uh, don't think it's a ri get rich quick scheme. Uh, and it's also not a Ponzi scheme. It's not like, uh, you know, it's basically going to be uh, the more views you get, more you get paid, but it's not a ton. Um, you know, you have to get millions and millions of views a month to make a living off from it. But I'm working there, heading there. Anywho, but the baits that I made, really excited, really proud about those things. We'll be making some different collars. Uh, I do know one thing, though, about making baits. It's really addicting. One, make sure you have great, great, great ventilation. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I have, I don't know if somebody painted cars in my garage before I bought the house or what, but if you flip a switch and it pretty much will suck everything out of the garage except you, um, which is good. But make sure you have ventilation out there because it is it's nauseous stuff, man. It'll actually make you, you know, give you headaches and make you sick. Uh, just stinks to high heaven. So make sure you have that. One of the things that I've noticed is that, first off, the, the molds are the most expensive part. I got a Yamamoto 4-inch Cinco mold from Do-It Molds. And uh, actually, um, Matt Nolan was telling me the other day that the reason that they were able to do that is they um, actually licensed that from uh, from Yamamoto. So that's why they're doing it. It's, that Yamamoto mold is actually about $25 to $30 more, more expensive than the rest of them so i'm sure they're paying royalties to gary yamamata when they sell those which is okay but i will tell you um super easy to use but if you're going to get into making baits even for yourself guys if you're going to get into this production style you're not going to want to do it like i'm doing injecting it each and every time um you know you're going to get into bigger production but if you're just doing it for yourself your buddies and stuff invest in multiple molds because it slows you down 100 if you don't have the correct molds um, you know, an injector, the injector that I have, I think it's a four ounce injector. I can do potentially probably three of these molds at a time with one injector full of plastisol. So instead of doing four, you would do a dozen at a time, which would greatly ramp up your production and also, um, you know, basically not keep you in your garage as long. If you can make, you know, if you're going to go fishing and you know, you're going to need a couple dozen of these, these things, you can knock them out. You can pour you can inject a hundred of them in one night and be just fine put them on your shelf and use them as you go um you know Corey and i were having a conversation about uh, marinating baits and jb's fish sauce which is something we'll talk about really quickly uh again you guys know that i'm a huge fan of the fish sauce here i have my own blend obviously signature uh pinch of garlic but um this spray right here uh cory was telling me obviously i knew that it had real crude fish oil in it if you're going to marinate a bag of baits like, for example, if I wanted to take this thing and I know I'm going to go fishing with these tomorrow and the fish are really killing it and I'm probably going to use this bag within the next week or so, 
um, you can pour this uh, fish sauce directly onto your baits and marinate a bag at a time uh, to do great amounts. You're not going to want to do that because the real crude fish oils in these uh, this oil or the fish sauce will cause the plastic salt to do some funky stuff later on. It's probably going to cause it to uh, break down and things. Um, and they do make a worm oil, oil. So that's what, again, what I'm doing is picking up the worm oil from them. Um, one of the things I noticed when I built these things, when I poured this, is that these things soak up worm oil like crazy. It is nuts. Um, but I've, had, I've enjoyed it. I'm going to pick up a couple more molds. Even if they're not the same thing, guys, if you're not pouring like 100 different Cinco's, if you have like a Cinco and a crawl mold and maybe a Cinco and a, um, you know, um, some kind of soft plastic jerk bait, like a fluke or something, and you can pour multiple of these baits at one time, it's going to ramp up your production and make you have a better time pouring these baits. Well... That is no good, no bueno. Um, I got lucky and caught two little dinks out there when I, I didn't see you guys, but I got the note from y'all. Um, I'm glad you guys caught one at Yatesville, which is weird. I'm usually the opposite. I'll go to Yatesville and not catch anything. That's why I go to Grayson so often. Um, I just feel like I have a better chance to catch fish at Grayson right now, which is weird. It is very weird. But anyway, let's talk some fishing. Let's talk fishing basics. Um, we're right now, not quite spring. We're getting close. There we go. The man, the myth, the legend. Corey Weaver telling you. Scented worm oil for long-term or bulk amounts of any of your favorite baits. There you go. If you're going to do one bait at, one bag at a time, the fish sauce is okay for limited use. Obviously, you don't want to leave it in there for months at a time. Uh, but the worm oil is good for the longevity of the bait. So, you know, all good. Everything's good. Um, also, guys... Good chance to plug this. Anybody that wants to order anything from JB's Fish Sauce, my code OALL on another line live. That's OALL20. Save you 20% off. Hey, Dylan. Thanks for joining in, man. Going to Grayson this Saturday to do some fishing. Do you have any bait recommendation for this time of year? Well, man, I can tell you I was out there on President's Day. So last Monday, caught two fish on a riprap wall on a ned rig so definitely try that um caught a lot of fish this time of year on a rattle trap out there on big flats uh something like a red eye shad and an orange red you know spring collar um i think a fire crawl will catch them eventually the water right now is really cold last time i was out there was 42 43 degrees i think you're gonna have a hard time catching them moving in that kind of water temperature but as water moves up into that 40 or that 50 degree water temperature range uh, it's definitely a good bait to check out, I do think that you could see 50 degree water temperature because it was 65 degrees today. It's supposed to be 75 degrees tomorrow, um, and it's not supposed to get any lower than like 55, 60 throughout the week. So you potentially could see that 50 degree water temperature around that area right there. And if that happens, man, I'm going to tell you what, it's not even close to being pre-spawn yet, uh, but I personally am going to start looking for um, channel swing banks this time of year. And it's just the way it is. Up and so pre-spawn, I'm looking for channel swing banks where the banks are a lot steeper. Uh, and I want to look for those banks that are steeper next to points and possible spawning areas. Um, you know, some of my favorite place in Grayson that you're going to find stuff like that is Deer Creek, which is right out of the main marina going left. All that back in there is Deer Creek. Uh, Bruin Creek is a really good one, which is right before you get to the bridge uh, left, that bridge, that uh, creek there. Uh, Clifty Creek, Jr. White and I was out there on President's Day, and he went back in Clifty, and it's like shaded back in there all the time, and he was breaking ice back in Clifty. So they got to figure that's going to be a little chilly in there. Um, the Brewing, or I'm sorry, the uh, Gimlet Creeks are really nice this time of year. But if you have a graph or you have a map or hop on something like the Angler app that potentially has those those maps for you. Uh, or um, I think I've showed you guys this before, but I want to show you really quickly here. The um, There is a Navionics chart viewer. And Navionics obviously has an application that you can put on your phone or you can put on um, you know, an iPad or whatever, and you can see these things. But let's see here. Let me share my screen.
So again, if you go to uh, Navionics.com and then you'll look for the um, it's uh, called Chart Viewer. So right here, this big thing I'm pointing at right here, Chart Viewer. So this is Grayson Lake. You see it right here. The cool thing about this, this is 100% free. You can pull this up on your cell phone. You're not going to be able to pull this out there at Grayson because there's no surface out there. But you can dig into here and you can see basic stuff. So again, this is the main marina right here. There's a boat ramp right here. All of this up in here is, um, you know, this is Deer Creek all the way up in here. Um, notice that all these big flats and things. So let's look. Um, so right here. So this is something that a lot of people don't know. This is the dam right here. But if you look at this, there's a big finger that comes out here. That's about 25 foot deep. And then, it, you know, this is all riprap in here. So the cool thing about this is that when as fish start pulling up and they start pulling up in these areas right here and, and pre-spawn because it's fairly deep right in here. If the weather and the water temperature becomes unstable, they have places to come back out. Notice it's 45 foot deep in here. So there's a lot of elevation change here within this thing. But when we talk about channel swing banks, what I'm talking about is things like this, you know, this really light blue here is the darkest or it's the deepest part of also the channel. So when this lake was dammed up, this lake is a, um, you know, it's like it's an Army Corps of Engineers flood control plane lake. So what they do this is they actually dam this up to hold the water to basically keep from houses in the area flooding and all that stuff. So they, you know, this was actually what I think I'm pretty sure would be Little Sandy. This would be the Little Sandy River, if I'm not mistaken, that's running through Grayson Lake here. But what I'm looking for is these channel swing banks that are right in this area right here, which causes these banks right here, if you guys can see my mouse cursor, to be really steep right here. Anywhere that you see these contour lines stacked up really close like this, this means this bank is really steep. So notice here it goes from 5 feet to 45 feet there and probably, I don't know, 20 yards probably. But the greatest thing about this little spot right here is that we have a steep bank and we have a protected cove right here. But this area all the way back in this spot right here is going to be a spawning flat for fish. I can almost guarantee it because of how, how shallow it is all the way back in there. Um, you know, you're looking at less than 10 feet all the way back through there and the dark blue is 5 foot. But these spots where you can see channel swings next to these banks that cause these banks to be a lot steeper, these places right here are going to be uh, things that I'm going to key in on in the springtime as the water is warming up. Notice that, you know, the channel swinging right here, this channel swing bank right here is causing another one of those things. Um, there's, a, there's a little, um, you know, a, a little cove here. So this channel swing right here is probably, it's fairly, I know exactly where this is at. Um, this little thing right here is fairly uh, deep. There's a really steep bank right here. There's a bunch of timber actually in this area. But there's two coves right here that could potentially have fish spawning in them as we go on. So am I saying that fish now are spawning? No, they're not even close. Water temperature is in the 40s. Um, but these are places that I'm going to start keying in on as the water is getting warmer. So I'm going to check these places. I'm going to go look for these channel swing banks next to places where fish are going to want to go in and spawn. They're, they're staging spots, guys. And the reason that fish want to stay on those steeper banks is that the water's cold still. They don't want to exert a ton of energy, but they have to eat. So in order to, to go up and down or vertically in the water column, only thing they have to do is inflate their swim bladder and go up and down. And they can traverse a wide range of depth just by doing that. And they're also using that really flat or the really steep bank as you know basically an extra teammate. They can drive these bait fish and things towards that thing and basically pin them so they can actually eat them. So if I am looking at a Grayson Lake like that, hop on the chart, uh, the chart viewer and Navionics, look for some of those channel swing banks where there's deeper banks next to places where fish are potentially going to be spawning in the next couple months. And I guarantee you're going to have success. Hey, Todd, man, thanks for stopping in anyway. I appreciate it, buddy. Hundred percent channel swings, secondary points in the first one third of creeks closest to the main rock transitions. Here's another thing that people that people like discount. In the springtime, when it gets into the spawn, and again we're several months away from it here in Ohio. I won't say several months. I usually think that fish are going to be spawning. I don't know mid April, uh, somewhere in there uh, here in Ohio. But a lot of people discount the fact that 
I look for northern and western banks in the spawn. And the reason that is is because the northern face, you know, I'm talking about the northern facing banks and the western facing banks is because the reason that is is going to get a lot more sun a lot more early. And another thing is that it's going to uh, get a lot of the warm southern winds early and often. It's going to keep getting beat up by those warmer southern winds, pulling that, you know, that warm air from the southern states, you know, down around the hemisphere and, and produce this warming effect. And the reason fish, in my opinion, I'm not a wildlife biologist, the reason fish stay next to chunk rocks more than gravel is that chunk rocks hold heat longer. You can go out, I, you know, test it for yourself. Go out on a 100-degree day, and I want you to walk next to a brick building. So a brick building is nothing more than a big, giant you know, piece of, of stone, basically, after you put mortar and stuff on it. But you can actually feel the heat off from it. But the really cool thing about it is something that really had me thinking about this as a fisherman is you can go by that, you can walk by that same that same brick wall at 8 o'clock in the evening when the sun's totally down, and you will feel that heat coming off that brick just the same as you would if the sun was beating down on it. It holds heat, no different than that. So it's basically acts, acts like this little sauna for fish. If it's summertime, guys, and the water is 85, 90 degrees, you might as well forget it. They're not going to be hanging around those rocks, especially if it's be, you know crazy right noon dead of the day they're going to be away from that they're going to be deeper but when the sun is warming those those lakes up for the first time in the springtime you can bet your ear in because even one degree water temperature change could be all the difference to make a fish bite and that's one of the things that you know i am learning as a fisherman as i go on is that all of these places that i fished i fished as a an angler just like everybody else probably started out at you were grabbing a Zebco 33 and like a Kelly's trick worm, and you were walking around a bank of a strip mine pond somewhere, hoping to catch a you know a bluegill or a largemouth or you know there wasn't any smallmouths in, in the ponds that I were fishing, but I was walking around beating the banks up. And I and there's always a joke running around. There's a meme out there that actually says you know we spend from the bank you cast from the bank to the middle, and if you're on a boat you cast from the middle to the bank, uh, which is is true story. I am now trying to break that cycle and learn how to fish away from the bank. Um, the biggest thing about fishing high pressured lakes like I do, Grayson, Yatesville, Vesuvius, um, you know, Rocky Fork, Paint Creek, these areas around here that I fish, they're high pressure lakes, guys. They're super high pressured. But the cool thing about it is, is that if you find places where people aren't targeting, you have a potential to catch some absolute hammer bass you have a potential to make a lot of money for a tournament fisher. The biggest thing about that is nowadays is technology. I'm going to be the first to tell you guys, I can't afford all the technology that all these pros have. You look at the, the electronics that these people have, their electro electronics alone are worth more than my entire boat. I just can't afford that as a high school teacher. Would I want to have one? Absolutely. If I could have four 12-inch graphs or you know 15 on my console and uh, 12 up on my console, would I want or up on my deck, would I want that? Absolutely. Like, you know, live scoping has changed the game. They do have the new live scope out I've been looking at. There's like, it's changed the game 100%. But I don't have the ability to do that. So I have to find little tricks like I just showed you, that Navionics chart viewer, and try to build patterns on my own. And I try to find things that people aren't keying in on. For example, those banks right there. That one little thing I showed you coming out from the dam. I can almost guarantee you if you fish Grayson Lake and you watch this video right here, I guarantee you didn't know that was there unless you've looked, you've got a nice graph or you've looked at something like that in the past. The 100% game about being a successful bass angler is putting as much knowledge in your corner as possible. And that's, you know, not only I watch videos like this on my, you know, of other people, I like to hang out and talk to you guys to get some knowledge from you guys. But becoming a better bass angler, in my opinion, is, is showing um how to catch bass in less than great circumstances going out and just randomly stumbling upon one spot that holds fish josh and i five four or five years ago fished a pedro tournament out of grayson pulled up on one bank one point guys one it's like a tertiary point a third so it was not a secondary it was the, the third one a tertiary point back in this creek we got 33 bass off of one point in Grayson Lake. Albeit one keeper, we got 33 bass on shaky heads on one point. 
It just kept reloading. We fished the same point for an entire eight-hour tournament. You want to talk about beating yourself up, man. I'm telling you what. We sat there until about noon and absolutely wore them out. And then eventually well, they just stopped biting. And I was like, do we leave? We've got 30 bass here. <clears throat> Long story short, had one keeper. You know, hindsight's 2020. As KVD says, don't leave fish to find fish. We didn't didn't find any more either. Stay on the bank. I've been talking to Matthew too long, or maybe this is Matthew. Matthew would be out, up on that bank with a nine-footer throwing a Israeli carp at a big giant flathead. Don't don't get it twisted. That boy can catch him. Yeah, man. Same with me. Um, so I was, I think, one of my favorite reels of all time was the Febco 33 micro underspin. I swear to you, I had more ultralight rods than anybody on the planet, I think. I, I you know, I just seemed like I had 10 or 12 of them as a kid. Uh, and the reason I had ultralight rods is like I fished like ugly sticks and stuff that you couldn't break because I was terrible on my equipment back in the day. But literally, that little Zebco 33 micro underspin, you could cast that thing a freaking country mile, and those little four-foot ultralight reel or rods could just absolutely horse some big old fish. Some of the craziest times I ever had in my entire life fishing was fishing with that stuff. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's amazing to me the 30 years. I don't know. I've been fishing longer than that. I'm 38. I'll be, well, I'll be 38 here in 12 days or 11 days, but... With 37 years, I've been fishing for probably 32 at least of that. Probably a lot longer than that. But I'm going to guess I was probably five years old. I was I was way younger than that. I'd say I've been fishing, you know, however long, 33, 34 years of my life. It's amazing to me how fishing has changed. And not only with the technology, because technology always changes. But for me as a fisherman... I enjoy tournament fishing. I enjoy going out and making content for my YouTube channel. I like making, you know, fishing giant tournaments. I like fishing really small tournaments. I like going out fun fishing. It's all the same to me. However, I used to look at a successful day fishing by just being there. Just being there. Being the, the ability. To, I spent more time around Vesuvius Lake when I was a kid than anywhere else on the planet. My parents would drop me off, myself, Kyle, my cousin Josh, there's about three or four of us every weekend. We were all together. We would go to Vesuvius, and this is way before all the nice stuff was bit out there, and walk all the way around Vesuvius fishing. And I swear, I don't know if we ever just absolutely hammered them. I don't think so, but we used to have fun and just have a blast. And I am, I am so glad, and I know these things right here are amazing. These cell phones, really cool, really amazing. But man, am I glad I got to I got to grow up with that one. I, I am so happy that I went outside and learned the love for fishing that I have from going out and, and enjoying my childhood. I, I feel so sorry for some of these kids that one, don't have the opportunity or two, don't have the want to do that anymore. And again, I get it. Things change. I see it every day as a high school teacher. Things change. I'm I'm at that point now where my jokes are not even funny with kids because I'm not even that old. But like I went to school with my kids' parents now, and you know I was just having a conversation the other day talking about um, the um, we were talking about the ghost of Kiev or what or Kiev or whatever the guy that's just absolutely wrecking havoc over there in Ukraine, which is amazing. Talking about that, I was like, you know what, guys, they're, that's just they're just filming the um, the second. You know, it's going to be Top Gun two. They're filming it over there. That's really just uh, Tom Cruise over there doing that, and they were like. Top Gun. What? I was like, oh my gosh. But I'm getting to that point. But I'm glad I got to get out and do some fishing when I was a kid uh, with those micro spins and things. It was so much fun. Um, and some of the things, maybe you guys don't have these same memories as I do, but there was a bait, bait store in our area. Um, and it was Hopper's Bait Store uh, down in Hangar Rock, um, Ohio. 
Uh, my mom lived, uh, I think, about three miles from there, uh, and that's on the road, not as a crow flies, about three miles, one direction from there. Uh, and myself and Josh and Kyle and whoever was there, we would ride bicycles all the way from there to uh, Vic Hopper's bait store, go in, buy some, again, Kelly Firetails. That was the it, that was only thing we threw, maybe some four-inch Zoom U-tails with one sixteenth ounce weights on these ultralights. We would go down there every weekend and buy baits and ride back and go fishing. So much fun. Yeah, so I'm looking at the I'm a I'm a hummingbird guy, 100. percent I I owe you know I'm just gonna lay it out. I owe about four thousand dollars on my boat still, which is I'm super happy about. When that's over, then I'm gonna put some new grass and stuff on my boat. But until then, I'm gonna pay my boat off. But that's that's what I'm looking at. So I'm looking. It may not even be until fall when this has happened. So I may spend one more year with the old six inch hummingbirds, which is whatever. But I haven't. That's what. That's another thing. It's like I don't know. What else? What to choose? I like hummingbird more than anything, but it's just crazy the amount of cool stuff that LiveScope brings to the table. I'm sure if you ask Kyler Beckman, who just recently won the uh, was American Crappie Trail uh, tournament, which congratulations to him. He's part of the JB's Fish Loss team. It's an amazing, amazing feat in and of itself. But he's a huge LiveScope guy. And he's a, he's a phenomenal at it, man. He can look at a tree and tell you if there's a crappie on it. If not, he'll go to the next one. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, man. Speed crawls are amazing. Uh, zoom speed crawls, great bait. Extremely great bait. One thing that I have noticed is they make a speed crawl magnum, which is like a four-inch version of that. I swear, I don't know if I've ever caught a fish on a Magnum speed crawl. You think fish would just hammer them as well as they do speed crawls, but they just don't. I think they're just too big. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm I'm on to your game. I see your game. I'm I'm heading out on the lake, uh, and it's weird, man. I'll be fishing tournaments, and I'll look around me, and there'll be 25 guys within a mile radius of me, and every one of them is baked. To, they're beating the absolute fire out of banks and i'm sitting out in 20 foot of water looking for that one stump i can catch a hammer off from which again i think that's how you become a better fisherman i get beat a lot i mean a lot but when you pull up to that magic hammer hole and you drop that bait down down there on old bertha's head and she bites your bait and you set the hook and you it's a no doubter and you have the opportunity to catch her because you're not you know she's not pressured as much that's what I'm trying to learn. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Mark Hickey, what's up, my brother? How was the show? The um, Indianapolis Boat Show. Did you guys sell anything? Uh, come on, Mark. You ain't got to rub it in like that, bro. Come on. Culprit purple worm. One of my favorite baits. I'm glad you mentioned the culprit worm. One of my favorite baits on the planet still to this day is a seven inch culprit u tail in red shad. That thing gets absolutely hammered if they're going to eat a worm. A seven inch culprit red shad. Yes, sir. Dude, we have to get together. Show me what it's all about. Show me why I need gar show me why I need live scope or live scope plus. I don't want to skimp out. I don't want to I don't want to cheap out because I'm going to be setting up my boat, I don't know, for an, nah, I hope not an eternity. But I'm happy with my boat. Knock on wood, my boat's running okay. It, I could use a little miss, more storage when you have 35 rods in a boat. It gets a little cramped. But that's my own personal fault. But I'm looking at that situation where there's just so much cool stuff to choose from. What do you choose? Again, I like Hummingbird. I think that they have a better product in the end. I think that's what it is. But Garmin has, in my opinion, one of the best live you know, features of things. Um, is there going to be somebody that will outdo LiveScope eventually? I think eventually it will. I swear. I don't know why it hasn't been done yet. Probably because of water clarity. But if you guys remember those cameras they used to drop down in the water, Aquaview, I think they were called. Is it so much of a stretch, especially in clear water, to put those on a trolling motor and have an actual TV screen there? 
Is that is that the next thing? Who knows? Good God, Mark. Calm down over there, bro. Can't hide money. <laughs> I so I'm jealous as hell, man. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like that's that's my dream setup. Um you can keep the the, the Lorance. I just I I like Hummerbird better. Lorance makes a great product, guys. I'm not I'm not knocking them. They're great. Um, but if I had to choose, or if there's somebody come up like, hey, what would you want if I gave it to you? It would be 100 percent Hummerbird. You know, so here's one thing that I am looking at. Um, you mentioned the ghost there. So the ghost trolling motor to me has me very intrigued. And here's why. And you just heard me talking about Lawrence and not having a huge love for Laurent for Lawrence. But here's why I think the ghost has a really good thing going is because you can run the ghost on 24 or 36 volt. It's not one or the other. If you go out and pick up a Minn Kota, and you buy a 36 volt Altrex, you have to run three trolling motor batteries, or I don't know if you're you got money like that, a 36 volt lithium or something. You have to have 36 volts. Um, but the the cool thing about the Ghost I like is that it has a spot lock feature or a you know an anchor feature. But right now I'm running two Odyssey batteries that are fairly expensive, They're like 390 bucks a piece. So if I have these Odyssey batteries running, I have two right now and one for the starting battery. They're the PCM 2150s. They are the 31 series. So if I were going to add another 31 series battery to the back of my boat, that's going to add like 60 to 70 plus pounds. And I know what you're, everybody's going to say, go lithium. Well, therein lies the problem. <laughs> lithium batteries are extremely expensive. I know they're light, but again, school teacher salary. So you have to keep that in mind. So when I put that battery back there, I have the ability. I think the cool thing about the Ghost is that if I bought one of those, I can put it on my my boat now, run it at 24 volts, and if I ever wanted to jump up to that and have more, you know, more thrust capability or more power, I could add that third battery, add that extra 12 volts, and and switch it up to 36 volt. So I think I have to commend them on that. I think that's a great design. Hey, man, I'm glad to hear that. It's amazing. The Mega 360. So, yeah, that's probably right. So, that, so there kind of in lies the problem. I, so, I haven't, I haven't tried any of the Lawrence Live stuff, the newer stuff. One of the things that I looked at when I was looking at that stuff is that little... little in my opinion, and again, this is from older stuff that I dealt with, I felt like the Lorance was laggy. Like if you had a touch screen and you touched it and tried to move, you would move it and it would be like, and then it would move. Like it absolutely drives me bonkers, like to have to wait on things if it's loading. And I'm sure the CPUs and all the RAM and stuff have got way better in these things, but it just, it just turned my, it turned me off. No, I guess I am not. Um, no, that is a, that is an awesome piece of information. I had no clue. Um, probably kind of like, there's a frog now that has Velcro on top of it, right? I think. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that's the business that the money's coming from there, uh, Strick. Wow, man. I haven't had my boat since a month after I got it. It's been getting worked on since April 3rd last year. Holy crap. Are they working on it or, or not? April 3rd? Man, that's almost a year. Kind of like me waiting on my uh, NRX Plus. Right now I'm at 217 days waiting on four NRX Plus rods. So hopefully I get them before four. Not, definitely not uh, counting on it. Hmm, Garmin. I don't know, man. Like I said, I am... I could be easily swayed. Don't get me wrong. I think I need to get in a boat with some of you guys that have them all and be able to 
under you know use them and get my hands on them and see which one I like best. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm maybe I'm you know head and shoulders behind the times. Maybe hummingbird isn't where it's at. But you know again is what it is coming from a guy who has uh hummingbird six inch graphs you have to understand that i'm uh you know 16 years behind the times probably it seems like uh well, not quite 16 years um yeah 16 years actually sorry 11 year warranty holy crap Yeah, so again, like I said, I'm running. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much they weigh. I'm gonna find out. I'm gonna see what they weigh. I know they're heavy, no doubt. They have more lead in them than most batteries. And I lied to you. They're way more expensive now. They must have uh, raised their price. Uh, the PCM, the 31 PCM 250. Uh, which is the marine deep cycle and starting together uh, is four hundred and seventy nine dollars right now. The weight per battery seventy seven point eight pounds. So seventy seven pounds doesn't seem like a lot, but when you add a you know four of them in there, does make a difference. My Stratus two hundred one Pro XL is not an absolute you know speed demon. It's not going to outrun Stricken as three hundred, but it does all right with me and myself and a fully loaded tournament rig, three quarters of a tank of fuel and running a 28 pitch raker. Um, I can get to about 73 miles an hour fully loaded. If I'm totally empty with a quarter of a tank of gas, the fastest I've ever had is 75 mile an hour with a 25 pitch rake or the 28. Let's see. 28 pitch raker. Sorry. I think I miss said that a while ago, but I can tell the difference by adding these new batteries to me, new to me batteries. They, I had uh, or I had Decas for a while. Uh, I like Odyssey for the simple fact is that they use virgin lead. If you're going to be using the you know the the lead bath style batteries, uh, Odyssey uses virgin lead so they can actually put a lot more thinner plates a lot closer together and get way more power out of the same footprint of battery. What's up, Larry Slack? Hey, buddy. And that, that's the thing, man. Like, there's no, like, indefinite. There's no, like, there's no, like, yeah, this is the absolute thing. It's like, you know, look at Jacob Wheeler, right? He's running Garmin, Hummingbird, and Lawrence. You know why? Because none of them do everything. Uh, and that's the, that's the hardest part, man. Like, you have to, no matter what company you choose, you either have to run multiple companies or you have to choose which um, you know, which things you're willing to live without. So a company, I think if they want to make a billion dollars has come out with a single system that does everything well, it doesn't have to be extraordinary, but if it does everything well and it works fine and it does exactly what you want, maybe it's not upper tier. It may not be the, um, you know, the Lamborghini of, of the graphs of the, of the time, but if it is solid, rock solid and works and I can see things on it, I'm okay with that, but like that's the the biggest issue is like you never as fishermen. I'm a technology guy, you know. I'm a technology guy. I I teach technology. I love technology. I I dig into new technology. That's why I like the Angler app so much. But I wish that there was just a you know an end all. Here's where you go. Even if it was more expensive, right? If it was like five thousand dollars for a super high end graph. Okay, well, five thousand dollars would be well spent to have one graph that does everything, as opposed to have four graphs of three different companies that now you have the entirety of the thing. Dude, that is nuts. Um, did you get that fish sauce, Jordan? I think I, I sent it to you. I want to make sure you got it. Man, I don't. I talked to Drew last weekend or two weekends, well, whatever the show was the other day um, in February, and he really didn't know the answer to why they're so backed up. Again, Tackle Box has a ton of them still, um, which, you know, I've already paid for them and so have you. But 
According to Ethan, who is the now regional sales manager above Drew, I believe, through Sportco, he said that they ramped up production a lot in December, so we should be seeing those things very soon. So stay tuned, sports fans. Let's see. Hummerbird Graph and the Hummerbird work way better than any Garmin I've used. And, you know, man, like I said, it just goes back to the situation that there's no right answer. If you want to do this, then you have to choose multiple companies or just figure out what you're willing to live without. And that sucks. Eighty one pounds a piece. Yeah, man. But that's technology for you. Um just to I was telling my students today, this cell phone that I hold right here is a uh, iPhone. Uh it's not the newest one. I think the newest one's a 13. Don't quote me on that. I think this is a 12 Pro Max. Um, there's more technology in this phone that sent the man to the moon. And that's one hundred percent true. It's crazy. Um, technology is gonna get better, technology is gonna get faster, it's gonna get more cheap it's going to be easily accessible we're now at this place at like quantum physics or quantum computing where things cannot get any smaller um and we can't get any smaller because unless we you know we're at the molecular level now we're at the nano level uh and if we're building things at the nano level and the only, only way we can get ch closer to being smaller than that is to again go into quantum physics and quantum computing which way over my head don't get me started on that stuff because i couldn't tell you anything about it but that's where we're at so things are as small as they're going to get i think you're going to continually see them get faster and faster and faster due to manufacturing techniques and things and you're going to see people getting rid of the fluff on stuff they're just going to make you not really strip down but they're going to make stuff that works 100 percent of the time and i think the the rock solidness or the reliability is what's lacking in electronics it's all good, man. Like I said, you won fair and square. Just want to make sure you got it. Yeah, dude. Let's go. Obviously, I'm I'm ready to go fishing anytime. Yeah, boy, down there, Dale Holler. Saw that, man. That's gonna be cool. I saw that Eric's uh, done pretty well down there at uh, the Big G Gunnersville. Done okay. It didn't look like he uh, found him there the last day. Uh, Brandon Klein was down there fishing the same Toyota series, uh, ended up cutting a check, which is pretty cool. Said that he, uh, found some fish and went to the place he found the fish and the quality size wasn't there the first day because the wind was beating up the bank that he found the fish on and it was tough to catch him. So he ended up finding a limit next day, had a decent sack, uh, cut a check, which is amazing. Uh, I think he told me after fuel and everything, he made 20 some dollars which is nuts. Like fuel economy guys. I feel bad for you. I know Brandon Klein's got a diesel. I had a diesel up until a couple months ago, $4 and nine cents a gallon here in Colgrove for diesel fuel. And it's not going to get any better. You know, I made the post last night. It was funny. I was just being funny about it saying that if I, you know, if some of you guys didn't start watching my YouTube channel, I was going to have to start an OnlyFans to pay for gas just to get back and forth to Grayson, which is 25 miles from here. Heck yeah, Elon Musk run, runs lithiums in his Teslas. <laughs> he looks on old boat. New one came with Lawrence HDS, and I hate them. It would take Bill Gates seven years to set the clock. Way too difficult to operate. Good imaging, though. Again, it comes back to the situation of where, which way did it go, George? Which way did it go? Which way? Which way do you go? Now, like I said, Jacob Wheeler has the has the you know the the game figured out. He runs all three, but you know why? Because he gets them for free. I don't know, but yeah, Aaron, definitely get out with you. Check him out. I just. I don't want to, as you know, we were mentioned there a second ago, as uh, White Bass there said, um, as soon as you buy something, it's outdated by the time you get it in the parking lot. 
I don't want to buy something that I'm going to regret buying because I'm going to be not really stuck with it because I want to be stuck with it, but I'm, I want to, I want to get something that works well that I don't feel like that I need to upgrade as soon as that next best, you know, that one of my, so I was at a retreat with angler a couple years ago and there was a fellow there and I'm not going to uh, mention his name because I don't, you guys probably aren't going to know him, but anyway, he was there and he's a marketing genius. This dude is an amazing marketing genius. And he was talking about this thing. He's like, you know what? He said, when I was selling cars, he said, I used to be a car salesman. He said, one of the things I would point out in cars was the sheer amount of cup holders that were in a car. He said, we had this minivan one time when I was selling cars that had 16 cup holders in it. 16. He said, I'm not kidding. It had 16 cup holders. He said, I could go and I could show these people a minivan that was less expensive and probably a better minivan and then go over there and show this to the one. And the only thing I'd have to say, but look, this one has 16 cup holders. And he said, that become my selling point. The 16 cup holders. This is something that doesn't have the rest. Like the, the rest of them don't have this. The other one's got 14 cup holders. You're going to get two whole full cup holders here for the same price. It's also all about finding that marketing ploy and that marketing technique. I think that um, I think what I'm going to call is that at the at ICAST this year, which is in July, I'm calling that you're going to see somebody come out with something that's going to blow the market doors wide open. You see LiveScope, you got LiveScope Plus now. I feel like Garmin, somebody like you know Laurent or Hummingbird. It could even be Lawrence. I feel like somebody's going to come out with something and you're going to say, life's go poo. I don't know what it's going to be, but I swear at ICAST, I feel like that's what's going to happen. <laughs> come on. Uh, recommendations for good baitcaster. A Fluger President XT, but I'm looking for something that's smoother and has more distance. Man... So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you all kind of them right now. First and foremost, what you have to understand is that Shimano and G Loomis are affiliates of my show through Tackle Box in South Point, Ohio. So I'm going to give you recommendations for Shimano reels. Um, am I saying that you should go out and buy Shimano because Shimano's or Shimano's or Shimano's better? No, here's the deal. I fish Shimano because I feel they're superior, and I fish Shimano's because they're a little bit more expensive, but it's a it's a it's uh, an investment. You know, I'm still fishing uh, E-Series Chronox that I had eight years ago, nine years ago. They're still fishing perfectly. I grab them every day when I'm fishing. No doubt some of the best reels I've ever had. So it all depends on your price point, man. And I'm going to, uh, you know, scare you here with some of the prices. Maybe I won't. The absolute most crazy reel on the planet right now, in my opinion, is the Core Solid Metanium. And the reason I say the Core Solid Metanium is one of the best reels on the planet for Shimano is that it casts an absolute mile. It feels solid in your hands because it has the Core Solid Hagane body. It also has the MGL spool, which is uh, it takes away a lot of the the light. It takes away a lot of the different things on the uh, the spool. Uh, a lot of the extra weight and things makes it lighter which then causes the reel to have less startup inertia so you can cast a bait a lot farther. But one thing that I want to tell you is if you grab a hold of Metanium for the first time and you go out casting with it, be careful because I promise you, if you whip that bait caster like any other bait caster you've had in your life, you will be picking out a backlash that you, you, you'll never even know existed that, that, that deep because the it absolutely casts that far. My favorite... I won't call it even a budget reel because it's really not. Um, the Shimano Corrado 200K uh, is an absolute game changer when it comes to a reel. You're looking at 189 bucks there, 179 you can find them some places. You might be able to find them cheaper than that. Um, has a wider spool. There is a 150 series you're going to find that's a little bit more expensive than that. Uh, I, I know for, for sure that Shimano and G Loomis raised their prices 10 to $15 across the board. That's reels, rods, everything. So these say these reels used to be 169 bucks back when I was buying them and I still have them. I have like several of them. I think I have four of the Corrado 200s in there. 
Um, on a lower end of side, guys, if you're looking for something that's more budget friendly and it's going to be phenomenal, it's going to be hard to break and it's going to last you for a lifetime. The Shimano SLX reels are phenomenal. You can even get into the SLX DC lineup for a, a decent amount of price, which is going to have the same uh, digital control system that the Corrado DC has. Uh, the Metanium DC has something a little different. The algorithm is a little different, but the exact same uh, chip is in the SLX and the Corrado. The only thing you're getting in the Corrado is you're getting better, better bearings and you're getting micro module gearing uh, in the Corrado. SLX DC is amazing. The regular SLX is a phenomenal reel. Uh, my favorite out of the SLX lineup is going to be the SLX XT. And the reason I like the XT is that it has the external brake adjustment. You're not going to find that on the regular XT and you're not going to find the regular SLX. You're not going to find that on the DC as well. The uh, SLX XT is a phenomenal reel for the price point, has an external brake adjustment. I would look there for sure. So again, most budget, budget friendly I'm going to recommend is going to be the, um, the SLX XT. Again, that's uh, the SLX that has the external brake adjustment. Uh, next, going to be the Corrado lineup. Uh, my favorite is the 200K. Uh, if you want to step up to that 150, which is a smaller frame, it uh, doesn't hold as much line, but the I'm sorry, the 150 holds basically the same amount of line. Um, the 70 series of the Corrado is the one that doesn't hold as much line. Uh, and if you want to go go big or go home, uh, the, the Core Solid Metanium that came out in 2020, which is the newest Metanium that you can get, is absolutely phenomenal. I think the Bantam that just come out will be a an absolute game changer as well. It is the smoothest, and when I and you guys just heard me talk about the Metanium. Metanium is my favorite reel of all time right now. But it the Bantam that's just now coming out, that will be shipping in March, is the smoothest reel I've ever reeled in my entire life. Hands down, no question, there is no manufacturer in the world that I feel like has made a reel that reels smoother than the newest Bantam that came out. It is absolutely that good. Wow, dude, that doesn't seem right. Are you, sh are you sure? Um, the cable going to your graphs is big enough. I know if it came pre-rigged from the, um, the the shop, they may not have used a big enough gauge cable, and it might be drawing too much amps. Um, does when you start your motor, does the graph go off? Does it freeze or anything like that? Great advice there, Corey. So an A-Rig, A-Rig, where legal? Again, they are quickly becoming, you know, especially in the tournament world, they're getting outlawed everywhere. Um, one of the big things about the A-Rig, though, be careful on your local restrictions and the places you go out fishing because some places like here in Ohio, you can only have three hooks. You can have as many dummy baits as you want, but you can only have three live hooks, whereas Kentucky, right across the river from me, literally you can have five. So be sure you, re you read your local regulations or whatever place you're fishing. Jerk baits are amazing in the springtime. I like them a lot. You guys saw it on my last video too. My favorite jerk baits right now are the is the Jackal Rerange 110. And I think the new Shimano World Minnow is going to be a player too. I love that flash boost technology they have in there. Again, guys, it's nothing more than two springs on both sides of the front style of the bait. And it has a piece of aluminum. It's not foil. It's come like a piece of plastic that's aluminum coated. But when you jerk the bait, when it's setting still there, that piece of plastic is still flashing in there. So it's going to make it look like that the bait is still moving, even though it's stationary, which is going to be cool. Um, Flat-sided crankbaits, I cannot say enough about. Um, if you are into the baits that don't make any noise, the Strike King Chick Magnet is an absolute amazing flat-sided crankbait. The thing has an amazing action, runs really well. I have three or four of them. Um, they're one of those baits that you can pull out of the box every time, tie on, and they're going to run correctly. I've had no issues out of them. Amazing flat side crankbait. Uh, super, super cool. One of the crankbaits that I have several of them and I don't throw, and I think they were the biggest flop for Strike King, was the 1.5 Deep. They had the big, long, flat 
square bill, dude, those things, you couldn't have had a truckload of them and picked five of them out of the truckload that would run straight. They were the worst running crankbaits on the planet. I hated them things. I still have a box full of them. And I don't throw them because they're. I just think that they suck. And again, having graphs like that to be able to find things is, is amazing, and I'm hoping to get there very soon. Um, Crowder DC is absolutely worth the money, man. Um, so one thing that I want you to know is that the DC technology has a time and a place. Is it a flipping and pitching reel? I think no. I don't think you're using it to its full potential. If you're going to be using it for a flipping and pitching reel, stay away from the DC. However, if you're going to be throwing crankbaits, you're going to throw a spinner bait, if you're going to be throwing some kind of moving bait like a swim bait, something that you want to get a lot of a lot more line out on, it's absolutely a game changer. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I can cast a bait at least 10 to 12 yards farther than a guy standing right next to me using an exact same bait and a regular Corrado reel. The Corrado DC is a game changer for me because you can cast a bait into the wind. You know, how many times have you made a cast with a crankbait and a gust of wind comes and pushes the bait back at you? Next thing you know, you got 75 loops of line on your reel. That doesn't happen with the DC. The Corrado DC is an absolute amazing reel. But again, do I feel like it's a flipping and pitching reel? Do I feel like it's a close quarters combat reel? No. If you're going to be throwing moving baits like small crankbaits to, you know, any side of crankbaits, to be honest with you, if you're wanting to get baits out and you want to cast a long distance, DCs are absolutely worth the money. No, Mike, I don't, man. I don't have, I got, I got two hummingbird six inch graphs. My, my six inch on my console though does have down scan. I mean, watch out now. Uh, are you talking about a, uh, I'm not sure. I've ever heard of that, to be honest with you. The casting reel. I'm not sure that I've ever heard of that reel. Um, could be an older one, but I can guarantee you that they do not make it unless it's a saltwater reel. This looks is good. Yeah, man. So, Adam, I, I'm not saying that I'm not knocking the people at, at Skeeter, but check and make sure that the cable is a thick. So, I'm not an electronics guy. Find somebody that is. Uh, I know that there's a company out there called Clearview that runs a really thick cable from your graph to your boat battery. And it does a lot for your uh, imaging. It clears up the image. And it also gives you plenty of cable to pull the amperage that, you know, your graphs are going to need and things. Um, I feel like there's something wrong there for that, uh, to be doing that. Um, you know, I, I was giving Lawrence hard times, but I don't think, I think there's something, like, I think there's a power issue there. If it's stuck on the same lake from previously, it's almost like it's not losing power at all, even. Uh, which is could be the case too. Is it hooked up to your main power switch on your boat, or is it is it directly you know hooked into the battery? Something you should be checking it out. Yeah. So when I when the DC reels come out, it was something I was kind of like leery about. I was like, man, I don't know if I can get into this. But I tell you what, man, you're out there and you're just chucking like. A, so I was throwing. I, I had the other day. Uh, I was throwing a crankbait um i think it was a 3xd on it just whipping that thing man um brandon buckner and i was out it was actually new year's eve we were fishing and i was just absolutely just was like look at this man you can cast this thing a country mile it wasn't even that it was a flat sided crankbait but i could throw it at least 10 to 12 yards farther than i could my corrado which was sitting right next to it with the same bait same line and everything um it does make a difference yeah i'm with you guys again i want you to know that I'm, I say Shimano and take that for what it's worth because um, they are, you know, an affiliate of the channel here. This is a new Vanford. 
Uh, and really quick, guys, we're about an hour and 14 minutes in, so I'm not going to keep you guys very much longer here. But when you buy a spinning reel like this from Shimano, they always come with um, like carbon washers in there. And I've asked a hundred people, it seems like, all the time. They always, I get, I get these questions all the time. Hey, Tyler, I got this brand new Shimano spinning reel and the line is favoring one side or the other, either the top section or the bottom section. It doesn't, you know, stay very, very well in the center. And what can I do about that? Guys, those washers that come with these reels are for that purpose. If the line is coming more towards the top, it's thicker towards the top, put one of those washers on top of the other washers that are already on here, and that will give you the spacing you need to actually fill that spool equally. On the other side of things, if it's filling more towards the bottom, take one of the washers that are already on there, take it off, and then see what happens. It, it allows um, you to change it. 99% of the time, you don't even have to touch it. But if you ever get to that point where you see your lines actually, you know, congregating at the top or the bottom of your spool, take that for what it's worth. Again, if it's congregating at the top, put another washer on there. If it's congregating at the bottom, take one off. And that little minute adjustment will cause your line to actually uh, lay on the reel flat. All right, guys, we're about an hour, 16 minutes in. I appreciate you guys sticking around for this episode of On Another Line Live. Stick around for some new videos coming out on the channel this week. I have some posted up ready to rock and roll. You'll be seeing those as we come on. By the way, guys, the video that I posted making the Do It Baits or the Cinco's with the Do It Baits uh, kit uh, is the first video that I've ever uploaded to my channel in, in true 4K video or resolution. If you guys watch my video about making YouTube videos, I told you guys 4K video is not the way to go when you actually want to upload videos for your first time or, or edit videos. And here's why. I edited a 30-minute video, guys. And I rendered it out at full 4K resolution, and it was 37 gigabytes of hard drive space. And not only that, it took nine hours to upload from my computer here in my house to YouTube. And then it took another 12 hours to finally render into 4K on YouTube. One video. Stay away from 4K unless you just want to have some absolute hair-pulling good times. 1080p, 60 frames a second, and you'll be right on it. Guys, thank you for joining this episode of On Another Line Live. Uh, if you guys are going to be down at the Classic here in a few days, let me know. I'd love to hang out with you guys. Um, last but not least, you know, we like to uh, throw out some names and stuff to help you guys out. I said it earlier, jbfishhouse.com, O-A-L-L-2-0. That's the letter Z O, not zero. So O-A-L-L on another line live 20. will save you 20% at checkout. Again, if nothing else, it's going to save you shipping. So basically like, uh, you know, it's uh, Amazon Prime, bros. So get it. Um, Apexfishingapparel.com. Use Waller 10 to save yourself 10% over there on Mark Hickey's uh, amazing apparel stuff. Uh, Mark, I was out fishing the other day with one of your shirts on underneath the hoodie. I was going to go out there and get you some, you know, really mediocre photos of me fishing. Uh, and it was too cold, man. <laughs> it was freezing. I didn't take my hoodie off, so I'll get you. But anyway, those two people there are definitely people that I trust their products. So you should too. Again, guys, I appreciate you guys sticking around for this episode. Adam, there you go, bud. Holler at uh, Aaron there. He'll get you hooked up. Eight gauge. So there you go. That's what you should be looking for. Same as Clearview and the connectors. That is pretty cool. I'm glad I know that, Strick. I'm glad you have that because uh, when I upgrade my graphs, I'm definitely going to be adding those for sure. But again, guys, thanks for joining around this episode of on another line live, there will be new videos coming out this week. Thanks for the support on the YouTube channel. You guys are rock out there. I have, uh, I'm going to check really quick just to make sure I'm not lying to you. Uh, and the, let's see here. Uh, let's see. 3,351 subscribers, a grand total of 100 for this month. I had 116 last month. Guys, we were well on our way to that 4,000 subscriber mark, and I couldn't do it without people like you out there. So I appreciate it, guys, more than you know. If you guys can, 
get out there and lean on them. We'll see you next time on another line.